I think so. Yeah. Right. It's coming through. Cool. All right, man. Well, let's just uh, make do. Great. <laughs> Mate, why not? We're on table tennis table. Yeah. This is how we roll. Yeah. I don't think it's too obvious in the camera. No, nah, it's, it's, gr- <laughs> it's fine. You know, man, let's just start the way we normally do and um, talk a bit about how you actually got into trading. So where did things, like, where did you start out? Uh, it came down to, um, you know, I was in banking for about six years prior to that in sort of the commercial banking. So I worked at ANZ, Westpac, um, and I, I've always had sort of a interest in the markets, right? I've moved from commercial banking through various different divisions until I got to where, where I thought I wanted to be, which was the so-called equity division in uh, Westpac. It was more of a product-based role. Um, there weren't any real trading or market-based. So I pretty much walked out of that job because I was unsatisfied. I sat down to myself and went, what do I actually want? I started listing the things I want. You know, went from being remunerated properly or according to, you know, your contribution, freedom of time, freedom of location, um, and, you know, no red tape. And kind of actually came down to either, you know, becoming a, um, you know, celebrity or trading. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I went with that. Um, and then and I just started looking. You know, and back then the old Genesis, Allium, you know, that they, they had a, um, they were on seek, they had a job application and I went for it. Uh, okay. Okay. And had you done any trading on the side, like while you're doing this? Yeah, thing? I have. Um, I was doing CFDs, um, just, you know, probably pop a couple grand in the account, did, did sort of everything, you know, from FX to gold to index, um, blew up two accounts. I pretty much was like, yeah, I don't know how to trade. (laughs) But, you know, um, I was happy to actually get the opportunity at Allium because, you know, I think working at a professional firm, getting trained up alongside other people trying to make this living and they're all committed to it. You know, this is not some sort of spend a bit of time at home, you know, in the afternoon or at night, you know, after your daytime job. It it, it gets you quite motivated. And, you know, that, that actually helped me a lot. Yeah, okay. And so those two accounts that you blew up yep. while you were just trading on the side, yep. uh, was that any like real money? Like yeah, obviously it was absolutely. real money, yeah. but like was it just a couple grand? Yeah, it was, one was three, one was five. Okay. So it wasn't crazy, but I guess I, I did take it seriously, um, even for the amount of money that I was trading in the sense that, because for me it was, if I blew this up, it's, it's really bad on my own sort of mentality as yeah. well. Of um, course. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you mm. actually is why you made the decision to go into prop trading. Like mm. obviously you could have continued as a retail trader, yep. uh, but you made a decision to actually look for a prop firm which was hiring at the time or yep. taking on new traders. Yeah. What advantages did you see of actually going down the prop trading route? It, it actually is different to what I expect it to be. I initially thought, you know, I went back and looked at how I blew up my accounts. I thought, well, it's pretty clear. I don't know what I'm doing. And I was here to learn knowledge and, you know, go, wow, you know, there are people who's made it in a career. They should be able to teach me. It turned out actually to be something different, but also in a good way that helped me, you know, coming to a prop firm. What what it does is it sets you up in the right mentality to be successful you know you're now treating this as a full-time job you're committing your entire day into it there are like-minded people next to you it's less about the, the knowledge which is important but more about sort of how you approach it which i think is probably more important to to become a successful trader than some crazy you know strategy or, or system that you find somewhere so when you started, uh, did you go through a training program of any sorts? Yeah, I did. Um, I would say it's very rudimentary um, in, in a sense that it's more about learning what we trade, right? So at Allium, we traded interest rate futures. You know, Very few, I think, retail traders get to trade that um, or even look at that market. Um, so you got to learn what what the bills market look like, what the bonds market look like, how it even works. You know, very sort of basic knowledge base um, and a sort of a, a strategy that I would say is, is very basic. Um, most of the learning, and this is the important part, which I learned about coming to a problem, is from yourself, you developing yourself. And that's, without someone telling you that's the way to go, it feels wrong. Um, you know, like other things, you feel like you should consult, you know, all the experts and, 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 you know, get all the knowledge that you want. But it's more so actually 
training base. It's a trading skill base. That's, that's I guess, the main thing I learned going to a prof firm. And so when you started, did you start with like a group of other new traders as well? Yeah, yeah. So the, the program at Allium was they take in, they have an intake, um, go to through a training program, which is also an assessment, right? So at the end, people start falling off during the course or get fired. Um, they take on, say, four to five at the end of that course. Okay. Now, obviously, just, I guess, going back a couple steps, when you applied for this job, mm. or it's not really a job, is it? No. There's no salary. No. Which is something else I want to ask you about. Sure. Uh, but obviously, there's a lot of people who are going to apply for that sort of role. How come you got uh, given the opportunity or how come they picked you out of everyone who kind of applied? Like, did you have any skills or anything which you think uh, appealed to those who were in charge of the hiring? Oh, uh, uh, my, oh, and this is, this is probably a slight contribute. My, my honest opinion about prop shops, right? Now, there's, there's two types, you know, there's, there's types such as, you know, um, Optiva, Tibra, those guys, right? Where they pay a very high starting salary to grad. So they have a very, I guess, tough recruitment process. Uh, my opinion is it's actually not very hard to get into a prop shop provided you're the right kind of person. Now, that means sort of, you know, you're competitive. You are, you know, driven. You, you know, you, you, you're not scared of taking risks, right? Now, that sounds like everyone should have it, but, you know, people say they're competitive, but, you know, it, it's the actions that really count and people can tell after the interview, especially during that six-week program because you're going to fall over. You know, you, you don't know what you're doing in this market. You're going to get crushed and how you react to that is, is that shows the true character. So in that respect, I don't think it's very hard and I think I had the right personality for this, this sort of a role. You know, I wasn't scared of having no salary. I was, you know, I'm happy to take risks um, and I'm, I'm very competitive. I guess. So how did you set yourself up to go into prop? Like with regards to not having a salary, obviously mm -hmm. you'd been in banking for about six years or so yeah. where you were getting a salary each week or each month. And now you're going into prop trading where you literally eat what you kill. Yeah. Uh, did you have a uh, generous savings to fall back on or? Yeah, that, that was pretty much job? it. You know, <laughs> I, I, as I did my research into this industry and I realized you know, I wasn't naive. I was like, I'm not going to make money that first year. You know, you're learning how to do. If I do, great, right? But you can't really plan for that. I, I saved up, you know, a lot during my um, six years of working. I was actually going to buy a house. I'm not sure which one's which one's doing better, the, the <laughs> property or my trading career, <laughs> if I bought it seven years ago. But um, no, so, you know, I had a lot of savings to, to put me through and, and I was willing to, you know, go, I can probably live four years without any pay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, and that allowed me to, you know, to actually move on, move forward in this okay. industry. Yeah. Um, now, you said that you were at Allium. Yep. That was Mark Gardner's firm, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Mark Gardner is someone who has previously been on the podcast. This is all know that uh, episode 132. Um, what were some of the things you picked up from him? Was he, I, I presume he was probably one of the guys who was uh, quite influential to you early on and... Uh, is particularly as a mentor as well. Is that was that the case? Yeah, that was the case. I was just going to say. So, um, I mean, he he's obviously been involved in a firm, and there was two parts of my trading career that was you know sort of related, well, very working very closely with him. One was when we had a group of um, traders together that sort of he formed this group for us, um, and that really helped a lot. That's that's driven most of my sort of philosophy about how trading should be. It's a lonely job right if you you know there's no salary right there's not really much of a teamwork everyone's trading their own books so having somewhat of a team environment even just for the sake of you know having someone to bounce ideas off and having that casual banter when you know you're bored or the market's dead or you're just not having a good day trading um it's really important you know so that original group that was really important for me and then later on mark became my mentor officially um in a one-on-one -on -one um, basis and I think you know a lot of things the the most important thing I, I think I learned from is just the, an attitude you're gonna sort of bring to trading you know it's very easy to blame things you can blame the market you could blame you know the slow system you know internet speed whatever you'll f people find something to blame 
um, and and we we have one motto in the group that Mark brought up. It was called "Be Better," and that that literally answers pretty much every question you have. You know, why did you lose money? Well, instead of trying to find something to blame, "Be Better" mean means okay look at it how could you have improved it and if you keep having that mentality going into every trade that you screw up that you know you're going to be a much better trader no doubt yeah obviously you got to take responsibility and that's like uh mike bellaray always says uh, you can be better you can be better tomorrow than you are today yeah um so how did you go during that first year you said before that you were yeah. willing to you know you had enough savings that if a couple of years went by and you didn't make any money yeah. you would be okay but how did you actually end up going during that, that's, let's say, first year? Yeah, that's a very interesting story because there's two ways you can look at it. One way is in the first six months, I'd say I did really well. Um, I pretty much didn't have... I, I was one of those guys who started making money straight away. I figured out one specific strategy very early on and I just abused it. I mean, in a good way, right? And, and I kept going. So, so I clipped up very fast. Um, during the first six months um, relative to, you know, sort of what the typical rate people, you know, increase their trading size with. Um, and, you know, at that time, I thought I was, I was doing really well. What I later learned is, you know, for people, especially in their first year, they need to focus more on becoming a better trader than making money um, because later on the market changed and what I used to do um, stopped working and I had to learn the hard way, sort of how to how to make money again, um, and, and that that's something that it's easy to forget about because you know people come into trading and all they think about is how to make money, you know, how how to generate that income, and it's not about that. This is a long, this is a marathon. You know, you're here. If you don't have three to five years planned, uh, I would say to people, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. So how come what you were trading? stopped working like in your words you said it stopped working yeah. how come oh I, I, I can be very specific so when i first started there was a lot of random orders in the bills market in australia right and by random i mean people paying offers or selling to bids that are really stupid um you know th these are these are probably not other prop traders these are uh, most likely you know either investment banks or funds who who, who has some sort of a daily vwap target right they don't really care about individual fills they have a system that just does you know maybe, maybe it's a tier wipe system right just every 10 seconds or every minute drop some into whatever price now we trade intraday right um and for that i'll say intraday arbitrage or scalp right so we, we're only trying to make a tick or two per trade in the bond uh, bills market so whereas they have a bigger view of the whole day we would get fill on a bit and if we can sell the one tick higher that's our entire goal so i just you know came in and queued every single price um you know up and down obviously i was very diligent in managing so i don't get run over on them but i was literally waiting for the system to you know fill me for free and then just quickly get out of it so were you on both the bid and the offer that's that's right so i'd queue probably four four down four up from the market um, so if wherever we move, I've got somewhere, I've got an order there that could get filled by a lucky system. Okay. So if you get filled on the bid, then you're just hoping it's going to come back and yeah. Uh, well, usually offer. when I get filled on a bid, it usually be like a crazy bid. There might be 10,000 lots there. The offer will be choice, you know, no, no bids or offers there. So I'll be the only person trying to sell. And usually there's enough randomness in the market for me to get rotate that, which okay. is, you know, take for a point. Okay, and it's probably also worth pointing out, like if you're doing this in the bank in bank bills, yep. the range on any given day is quite small. Oh, very isn't small, it? yeah, bank bills. So it sounds crazy to just go for one single ticks, but you know, bank bills. Even in the old days, you're looking at four to five, five to six tick ranges on a non sort of tier one data, or if there's just nothing crazy happening in the world, right? Nowadays, it's even smaller. You know, you're talking about two to three. Some that sometimes one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. That's going to sound really insane to some people listening to this yeah. um, who, are, who are like very unfamiliar with that market. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what happened? Like how come, like you said you were trading that way for about six months or so yeah. and then you had to change things up because you stopped making yeah. money so doing that. So a couple of things came into play. One, 
there were less free orders. I think the executors, you know, in the investment banks or the funds, they started getting a little bit smarter um, about how they execute. And the other thing is our market became sort of more people join in. There was more algos who, who would be much faster than you at getting Q at a price. Um, so a few couple of things made that. And also as you trade bigger, um, you know, the, the random clip sizes that fill you, they're pretty small, you know, it's quite hard to get a big clip away. Um, hope on lucky fills. Okay. Um, so all these factors together made me not that profitable anymore. Also, it's very hard to go become a better trader. You know, you, you talk of, of all the, say some of the biggest traders you've interviewed, that is definitely not what all they do. Right. It's right. Yeah. And you said also that you got clipped up, um, quite quickly yeah which uh for anyone listening who might not understand that terminology it just means that your risk limits were increased yeah and you were allowed to uh take larger size positions essentially yeah um did that become an issue for you because you're allowed to trade bigger and bigger and bigger uh and then after six months or thereabouts uh you began to find that your strategy or the way that you had been making money was becoming less effective uh, did that cause you any grief, like because you were now trading bigger, and it wasn't really working? Like, did you? Oh, absolutely, and and that that's where I think the initial part of my career almost ended. You know, I I hit a plateau. You know, I couldn't, I I just, I just, I just couldn't bypass a certain sort of level of income, and I I sort of knew what it was, and I started to train deliberately for it. And you know, it is very important. So I realized I didn't know how to really trade aggressively into the market right i was just sitting passively on queues waiting for lucky fills um so i, I took two months off to practice that um when i say to took two months off as in i'm still trading but i recognize it's not about profits so i forced myself to not do what wasn't working what i was come it, it wasn't not working right it was just less effective but I decided to just cut that out. I was like, look, it's not about the money for these couple of months. I'm going to just work hard on sort of aggressive style trading, going to market, you know, trading the momentum, trading the flow rather than sitting passively. Obviously, that's not great for my p l for that two months. But I thought that was a very important lesson for me um, to be able to practice this deliberately. Okay, and were you on SIM during those two months or no. you still real money? Yeah, I, I, I would say once you've gone live, there's very little point going back to sim because all of the problems that come from trading is, is probably to do with mentality, to do with money. Right. You know, the losses, the wins. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you were at Allium for how long before you went to Macquarie? That was your next move, right? Yeah. So I did that for two and a half years. Um, and, you know, I would, I would say I, I was still stuck at my plateau despite having made a few breakthroughs in my sort of trading style. But I was still really plateauing and I wasn't sure why I wasn't happy, which is funny because I figured that out after I went to Macquarie. Okay, so yeah. what were you doing at Macquarie? Like why did yeah. why did you want to um leave? Like why did you want to make that move? I mean, I think I think I think the answer is a lot less noble than any of the other things. It it just sounds awesome. Like I just wanted to be an investment banking trader. Um it sounds good on paper and you know, it's something I've always wanted to do as well. Um, I've never been, you know, inside the trading floor of an investment bank. I want to see what it's like. I know they deal with huge institutional clients, huge orders. I want to see what, it's, what that's like. What sort of trading, like, were you doing there? Like, were you working orders for clients? Yep. Or, so, it wasn't actually proprietary trading nah, there? No, nah. I, I don't think many investment banks has proprietary right. departments, if, if any, um, at all. Um, yeah, so I was an equity portfolio trader um but by trader obviously not proprietary it was broking so i i you know looked after large clients which you know funds and global funds and stuff like that mostly and they'd have something say to do and then ask me to execute for them and they will give me what sort of result they want to achieve because there's a lot of different ways you can get filled or sorry a lot of different ways these uh um funds want to be filled um, and they'll give you the strategy and you work it for them. They might ask for your opinion. They might ask, um, you know, on your thoughts and what you've heard in the market, stuff like that. 
Okay. And was this in equities or was it in futures still? It was still? pure equities. So this was in physical equities, the Australian um, ASX. Okay. So that okay. must have also involved a bit of a learning curve because you were at Allium, you were just doing futures, right? Yeah. I, I would say the biggest learning curve was learning you're not prop anymore. And, okay. And, and, yeah. and to stop trying to put forward your opinion. Because, I mean, as a prop, if you don't have an opinion, there's no point, right? It, yeah. So how were you judged? Like what, obviously when you're a prop trader, you kind of yeah. ultimately you're judged on your P and L. That's right. Yeah. How were you judged at, uh, well, I don't know if judged might be a bit of a harsh word, but How, how's your work monitored? Yeah. Um, to be honest, uh, pretty much there's two parts to it. Cause there's also the sales aspect as you, you can imagine being a broker, right? You've got to generate new clients or at least expand existing clients. Um, and you're judged on commission. Right, you judge on how much commission you bring in. If everyone executes through you and they're all massive orders, you look amazing. Now, obviously, if you're not really good at executing, after all, people are going to stop giving you orders. You know, if you keep trashing, if you keep giving bad calls and you keep trashing their orders, it's that's going to affect it. But ultimately, obviously, it came down to pure the commission dollars. Um, and that you know that that was different for me that's that's the biggest part i struggle with you know i'm i sort of pride myself in having my own view and like you said you know based on pnl which is something very few people really cared about over there yeah you're a bit more in control of things i guess too yeah yeah so uh you made the return back to prop yeah when was that that was in december 16 okay yeah, december 16 um you know like so i I realized having done that and this is actually a really big turning point in my trading career because having done that i'll you know i had this dream job in my head and i've gone and done it i was like yeah it's all right i I actually didn't enjoy it as much as i thought i would um and so having done that it's kind of crossed up my mind and then i sat back (laughs) and going back what what do i actually know how to do like what am i good at like I think trading that's it there's nothing really else you know i really want to be doing so when i came back i came back with a very different mentality and i think this is one of the sort of things i do want to tell people about is like trading's not a let's test the waters kind of thing in the beginning sure like especially if you've got financial constraints but you need to commit completely to it and when i came back from macquarie and i realized this has to work now this is all i'm going to be doing there's no backup if I leave here, yeah, uh, you know, I'm probably qualified to get an analyst job somewhere, but I'm going to hate it. I'm going to absolutely hate it, right? And and it's not going to be great. So I really don't want that to happen. So in that respect, this became a must, must work kind of thing. And I'm devoted to it. I'm committed to it. And that changes things because when you're just testing waters, you're, you're unsure of whether it's going to work or not. So you're, you know, as soon as you hit something, like a big obstacle, a big drawdown, a big loss streak, you start looking for things you were good at. You start thinking about your backups. If you don't have a backup, then you're thinking about how I'm going to get get through this. And that changes a lot. Yeah, okay. So how did you treat things differently when you came back? Like, were there any noticeable changes? Like you said, it's like, like you just said, Mm. like you could go get an analyst job if worse comes to worse, Mm. but you said you would hate it and it's not something you want to do. You really wanted to be trading. How did you how did you change things or how did you do things differently this time around to make sure that you wouldn't have to resort to an analyst job? Yeah. <clears throat> um I think the f- the first thing was I I stopped trying to maybe prove like when when you start a trading gig, right? And you you're unsure of of what you what you want to be doing. I think w- you know, you, you try to play safe. You try to play not to lose a little bit. So, I mean, not for everybody necessarily, but um, especially when you come into a firm like this, you know, you, you, you don't want to be the first guy to get fired because uh, you've lost everything. But when I came back, it was, I realized, you know, I, this is a job that I'm, you know, this is not an eight hour job. This is, I mean, 12, 16, 20, you know. So I was much more committed. I, 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 I wanted to go much, you know, further ahead than than I used to, and all right, this must work. So I started looking for many ways to improve my trading rather than just look good, have a look good track record. 
for me, whatever was happening now, this is a process. I'm, I, I want to be there. Um, and that, that was important, having that goal in mind. So the, the results of my trading in the short term actually didn't matter as much. Um, and all I'm looking for is ways to improve myself. You know, I was much more open. I started talking to a lot more people about how they trade. I started you know, testing, being more active about my own trading and how to improve it. Can you just go into that a little further? Mm. I think that's that's quite an interesting point. And you, the way you phrased it as well, you, at the beginning, you were sort of playing not to lose. So I guess what that means is you were quite conservative in yep. the beginning. Yeah, because I mean, because people take different things into trading, right? Whether it be pride, whether it be, you know, um, I don't know, whatever you judge yourself. Maybe, you know, you're like, I'm a smart guy. I don't want to, I don't want to look stupid. Um, or whatnot, you know, because most people don't really sort of go through things where the outcome is not um, necessarily directly correlated with the effort you put in, right? So th- there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, so in the beginning, you know, you you come into, it feels like a very competitive environment, you know, there's six other guys that came in with me in the same group and I'm there going, okay, I don't, I don't want to be last, I don't want to be the first to get fired. Right. You know, I, I want to make the most money out of these people. So So it's all about the results. All I'm looking about, looking for is the results. Um, but when I sat down and go, well, it's going to be a lifetime career now, you know, the short term doesn't really matter. It's all about the long term development. It's all about where I'm going to be in three to five years. Okay. So you're willing to give up a little bit of P and L in order to try new yeah. things, kind of expand and your, in, 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 in a way, mentally, I was thinking like that, but what I found actually, it's quite the opposite. Your P and L doesn't actually suffer because of that. Um, the less you actually care about your PL, I think the better your trading will be uh, uh, over a decent sample size. Because um, that's where the mentality problems are. You know, all, all the things you hear about the greed, the stubbornness. Like, why are people stubborn, right, on a the trade? They're not stubborn because they, they got, you know, they have this crazy view about where the, I don't know, let's pick a currency, where the Aussie is going to be. It's more like, I don't want to lose. And right now it's a pay for loss. And, they haven't lost money yet it's not you know? realized that's right you know that, that's that's where a lot of these things come from right it's all when you think about money i don't want to lose money it'll come back i mean and and then it obviously dies on you but the reason you had that decision was because you didn't want to lose money or or, or you, you know you take profit way too early because you just want to lock it in put that money in your pocket but if you're thinking about how to improve your trading what's the best thing to do you know that changes sort of a lot of ways you can look at trading significantly. And that I reckon that single-handedly can take out a lot of the sort of typical mistakes. And that includes the things I've, mistakes I've made early in my career. If we had to just uh, pick on some of those, mm. I mean, I know you've already spoken about some of them, but what would you say are some of the, your most memorable mistakes maybe? Yeah. Um, I'll have to bring, bring it, the first one, I've got to bring it back to... Um, before I joined Allium, how I blew up my account. Because that was really memorable. That that probably, I'm actually quite glad that happened to me before I joined. So what happened was, I, that was when the Aussie dollar was at above parity. And and I was like, this is crazy. Why are we at parity? So I just had some crazy view, right? And so I had a five grand account, right? And I was only risking about $200 a trade. And I sold some at 101, 102, Got to 103, sold some more. Got to 105, sold some more. Stopped out at 110. And I'm pretty sure that is literally the highest Aussie dollar is since then. And that's six years ago. <laughs> Blew my account in one trade, even though I've been actually somewhat consistent in the three month leading to that. So so that that's probably my most memorable thing. I go, yeah, something about this is not right. And I need to learn about the mentally why this happened. Yeah. So, so that's, that's definitely a memorable mistake. Yeah, okay. And if you were starting out again, like today, yeah. and you had a, sort of most of the knowledge of what you had now, what sort of things would you do to help you gain consistency? I, I think the m- most important knowledge I have now over then is, is my mentality and psychology. And I'll go into them a bit separately, right? Um, so mentality-wise, I think going into trading... Um, when, when I started, I always was looking for a strategy, you know, a strategy, a system, how to make money. Biggest breakthrough I had was 
tra- trading is a skill and it's sometimes hard to really identify it. Um, so, you know, nowadays I give people a sports analogy that if you were, um, you know, because tr- sports is obviously s- completely skill-based, right? So if you were going to become a, you know, professional basketball player, right? You know, what, what would you be doing, right? You'd, you'd straight away think about, okay, you'd get a coach, you'd, you'd um, or at the very least, you start getting research on how to become a better player um, and you'd start practicing, right? In, you know, some very, very basic stuff, whether it's dribbling or just straight away, you know, free throws, whatever it is, right? You're not thinking about trying to win. You're not thinking about the NBA. Now, the crazy part about trading is, it doesn't matter how new you are, the only place you can play is the NBA, right? And, and people need to realize that. It's like this market, there's no, here's, here's where the not so good people play. There's one market and most of the people in this market are, you know, the, some of the smartest, you know, most brilliant people in the world who's done this for decades on, right? So day one, you're competing here. So thinking about how to win is crazy talk, right? And or focusing on it. Yeah, you want to win, but if that's all you're trying to do, you're missing how you should be training you missing you know skills and there is so much skills you know market reading flow reading pattern recognition execution speed accuracy um and obviously psychology which i'll go into a bit later you know that's these are all skills you need to develop and no matter how good your strategy is it's pretty useless without skills um and and so that is how i would go back and tell myself to approach trading you know don't come in here thinking you're, you're here to you know, sort of just straight away win or make money. You're here to develop a set of skills. And if you trade it like that, then you'll probably practice in a correct way. You know, you look at your, your you know, in the beginning, you look at your winners and your failed trades in a critical way. You know, what could I have done better there? The outcome's completely relevant than the psychology bit. And and I think this will be really useful for um, sort of people starting out um, who struggles with winning and losing, like the emotions that come with it, right? Um, I, I look at trading as a probability based activity, you know, there's never an absolute, right? Because no matter how much you think the market's going to do something, it potentially takes one guy to prove you wrong. Like one guy with a lot of volume and boom, you know, your entire theory, everything you've built up up to this point is now disproved. So, so it's a probability based activity and to truly treat it like that is, um, I, I use my, um, sort of blackjack dealer analogy. And this is why I teach my new traders as well. Um, so imagine if you're the blackjack dealer in, in a casino, right? And you're dealing out hands. Now you have absolute edge, right? You got 51%, that's that's already known or depending on the rules. Um, you've got the edge, so you deal the hands. Now the outcome of these hands are completely irrelevant, right? People, you know, that is not the point, the outcome of the edge, because over a hundred, a thousand trades, your edge will shine through. Um, so compared to say someone trading, it's actually the same thing, right? So so he's say he's you know, he's dealt his five hands and he busts. He doesn't go cry in the corner, he doesn't go blame the table, he doesn't go blame the game, he doesn't blame anyone, right? He's he just keeps dealing because he knows his edge is absolute. Um, and that that takes a lot of the sting out of your losers. Right, but if you can think like that, because obviously you need to find your edge and and how you know what, why do you know edge being you know the probably off your trade coming out better than fifty fifty, right? Why you have an edge and you got to define it. But once you do, you know the the outcome is completely irrelevant. You're here for the hundred thousand trades. One trade changes nothing. And the crazy part is that allows you to stop thinking about money, because you know the, the guy who's hired by the casino, right? The casino doesn't go to a dealer and go make me money because he knows he, it's not about that just just go and do the right do do the good traits right what you know works do that those traits and just keep doing them in real the out- outcome yeah 100 percent. and i think uh you know if, if anyone who's listening wanted to look that up a bit further they could probably research the subject of law of large numbers um because i think that's kind of exactly what you're talking about there yeah, yeah. Um, you know, getting into the long run. Um, uh, what else did I want to chat to you about? Um, oh, that's right. I wanted to pick up on something um, you said just before. Yep. I think it's really interesting how you said that trading is a skill and it's not so much just about having 
our strategy. Yeah. I think that was a really good point. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, now, where would you say your edge is today? Like, how are you trading nowadays? Yeah. Um, I'll, there's probably two parts to it. The first part, for those who are interested in the bills and bonds interest rate market, I can be a little bit specific. So the bills market, um, you know, we trade the futures contract, we trade the first eight calendars, right? When, hold on, let me just interrupt you right sure. there. When you say the bills market, what yeah. actually are bills? So 90 day um, interbank or well, bank bills, that's the full term. So they're a futures contract on, you know, the 90 day bills that banks lend to each other. Okay. Pretty much. Yep. Um, and so we trade the future contracts of those and the expiries every three months. So we trade the, f well, I mean, I don't know what other people trade. I trade the first eight calendars, right? So what are we now? We're in uh, November. So December is the first expiry and they'll go out for, you know, in three month increments up to two years out. Um, so having the benefit of sort of eight contracts in the same product but different expiry means we have very natural hedges and our hedges are often very absolute well not absolute but it, it's very correlated it's pretty much the same product um, unless someone you know unless the expectation of interest rates is different and specific to one month in particular that isn't going to break down anytime soon so one of the edges we have is the ability to you know, not lose money when you're wrong um, because we use, we're trading spreads, right? Um, so if you buy something and a market goes against you, you can sell a different contract, assuming you can't sell back at the same price, right? So you can't scratch anymore or get out for free. You can sell a different contract and that spread is something potentially that allows you to get out of this shitty situation down the track without losing any money. So that in itself is a big edge it's, I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that, but I'm just trying to give you know a very basic idea of that's one edge that's specific to this market. Okay, so can you just give an example of mm -hmm. that? Um, you know, we don't need to go into nitty gritty detail, sure. but like, let's say you're uh, you're long the front contract, yep. and it starts to go down. Mm. Uh, what are you going to do in a, a situation like that? Just yeah, I well, know you the, the front. <laughs> And this is very specific, but I can't just say because I'm sure there will be other bills traders listening to this. So the front's a bad example because that's really pinned okay. um, because, you know, interest rate's not going to hike or cut. So let's say, you know, the fifth or sixth contract. Um, yeah, if I buy something, I would have already had know what was my so-called exit, right? The exit being something to sell if I'm wrong. Um, and when I'm wrong, I mean properly wrong. You cannot sell the original price back. And if you don't hit that exit, you're going to have to, puke or lose money on the trade now after hitting this other contract i'm now in what we call an offside spread right now because um so spreads the spread actually has a market in the bills right and it's a tradable contract in in our market so there's two ways you can get out maybe the spread itself will trade out and allow you to get out for free maybe you'll have to you know get back into it again later um through the outrights the benefit of having this is you've got timed on your side. So once you're hedged, right, even if it's a really, really crap position, like from a spread point of view, you've got time on your side. So if you're long, the market is crashing down. You don't have time. You know, this could be seconds and you, you've already lost money. But now that you're somewhat hedged, you've got time to evaluate it and wait for an opportunity potentially to get back out of your original crappy spread. Okay. So are you starting off... Now, no, this isn't going to be completely accurate because in, in your situation and the way you trade, yep. very rarely are you flat and we'll, we'll get right. into that. Yep. Um, but when you put on a position, just in that example we gave yep. before, it, it almost sounded as though you were originally you had an outright position. That's on. correct. So, I mean, we, we can talk about sort of how, how I trade, right? So I trade what I'll, what I'll call inventory style. So by inventory, I mean, I put on sort of structures around my expectations of where the bill yield strip is going to be. Um, but I don't expose myself to the outright movements, right? In case something crazy happens, you know, North Korea launches a nuke, China's trade wars, whatever, right? The, that, that, 
that sort of outright risk is something I don't want to take. So I've got to pull on these structures. However, to put them on, I have to leg them or you know buy something, sell something. And during that period, obviously, I will be outright. Um, quite often for only seconds. Okay. But so that that is definitely where I would have outright. But majority of what I do is I put on you know a lot of these inventory with a view on them, and then I'm allowed I'm you know able to wait and until it's favorable to get out of those inventory. Okay, and with this type of style of trading, like you have mm. quite a large position on it, like all the time. Yep. But you're constantly hedging through various contracts across the strip. So just so if, if someone's listening to this and it's a yep. little bit confusing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it would be. You know, I mean, this 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 thing is, is part of what I teach to, to the people who sign up um, to become traders. And this is a four week full time course. Yeah. Um, so where are you actually making money? Cause you're working this position and you, you're never really getting flat, are yep. you? So you're just continually rolling in. To give you an example, right? So to be very specific, right? So let's say I'm looking at, so two spreads make a butterfly. So some people will know that, right? Um, I tr Right now I have a big position in the fifth butterfly. Um, it's just a two point range, you know, um, you try to sell at positive ones and get out at neg ones. Um, that's literally all I do. I try to put on as many positive ones I get out. And then when the opportunity comes, I'll buy back at neg ones. And that's two points there. Now, if you do that on enough inventory, that's, that's, you know, that's a decently good trade. So how long until you, let's say if you're in it, what was it? Positive one. Yep. And you want to get out at negative one. Um, how long might that movement take? So um, these inventories, anywhere between a couple of weeks to up to, you know, two, three months. Um, it really depends. So, and that's where inventory comes, helps with trading is that it allows you, gives you time. You get to wait until something's a bit whack and you're able to get it away almost freely. And, and that's one of the things, you know, spotting these opportunities. You know, you might be able to get positive ones away very easily and you will just load the boat up. You would, you know, completely max out your limits on those positive ones um, because that's been the range for the last, say, oh, 12 months, probably, probably more than that, to be honest. Um, and at the time you put them on, you know, it's probably going to be very hard to get them out and egg ones because, you know, everyone's just put them on. You can't you can't get them out, but now you have time to wait because you have a very safe structure. Yeah. Okay. Now you you spoke just before about uh, having a structure on or at least a position in mm. the fifth contract. Uh, for example, like what drove that trading decision? Like how come you were interested in the fifth contract? It was available. Let's be really honest. Um, it, you know, I'm always looking at all the different butterflies and you know other structures that are available across the bill strip. Um, and my own philosophy, trading wise, is you know, there's no point really going for the really hard trades. Just, just why make your life difficult, right? It's if it becomes available and easy to leg. And by legging, you know, when I was talking about it, just the the first initial outright exposure to get into these spreads. And then if you got put two spreads together, you get into these butterflies, right? So some sometimes those are very easy to do. Um, perfect example right now. Um, so I've been short the second butterfly for a couple of, for probably one and a half months. I was in, initially short at pars um, just yesterday. Um, next threes were at, literally at market. Um, by that, I mean no risk. Buy an offer, sell a bid exit my entire inventory you know it's it, and that's just become available okay so when you say it's available you mean it's it's trading on the bid at you know a price that you want to get filled that's correct out. yeah yeah <clears throat> okay yeah interesting and you're also so what we've been talking about here is predominantly uh the bank bills that's correct you're yeah. also trading the bonds oh yeah i also, bond yeah, I also well. trade a little bit in the bonds as well okay. the aussie threes and aussie tenure bonds yeah. okay how much of your trading would you say that makes up um, well, during rolls, it's a huge part of what we do. Um, I can talk a bit about that later, but outside of that, I'd say maybe 15%. Okay. Max. So it's very little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
okay, well, yeah, what are what are the roles? Yeah. I mean, anyone who's not in the Australian futures industry is... Uh, a lot of this conversation, I think, is <laughs> this is actually, very technical. Yeah, yeah it's um, <laughs> for, for a lot of retail traders, though, they're not exposed to this type of trading. Yep. So yep. I think it's interesting that they do hear about this no, sort of thing. That's yep, no, um, that's fine. To sort of know that there are other strategies and other ways of doing things out there which aren't entirely directional. Yeah. Um, so yeah, explain to what explain to us why you decide to get involved in the bonds during the the rolls period. So the rolls period is literally when um, the futures contract expire, right? So most of the time, now I mentioned, you know, in bills, we've got eight contracts that's always actively trading, right? Whereas in bonds, it's always just the front contract, right? Most of the time, no one's trading the back or say right now, you know, the December contract. No one's trading the March contract. Um, now during rolls is when people who are in a December contract, they need to, I guess, roll over their position into the March contract for, for, for the more long-term traders or, Actually, they're not, they might not even be traders. It could be like central banks because we're talking about government bonds here, right? Like, so as to who needs to hold these, you never know, right? So central banks, large investment firms, um, managed funds, you know, they might all need exposure to bonds via futures, right? And they don't really care about day to day, but they've got a sizable position and they need to, they can't let it go to expiry, all right? So they need to roll it over too much. So that's what happens. So the reason we trade that is for two reasons, right? One, during that period, there is a lot of free opportunities because, you know, this, and this will almost go back to almost what I was talking about in terms of when I was trading institutional at Macquarie is different people, like the large guys, they don't care about a couple of ticks. They just need to get done, right? And this is, you know, one week where everyone who anyone has any exposure to the bonds in a longer term needs to roll over. So they just need to get done. They don't really care about a couple of prices. Whereas that's our livelihood, you know. So there's a lot of free orders, a lot of free money, so to speak. You know, at least there's a lot of activity. So that's one to start with. It's the most intense week in a quarter. Um, I, you know, I typically trade 20 to 22 hours a day during that week. So I'll, in a row, like non-stop. Yeah, 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 that's right. So Monday and Friday. So I'll, I'll probably get about ten to fifteen hours of sleep that entire week. Um, okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that must have some challenges in itself. Oh, uh, <laughs> you get used to it. The first time wasn't fun. Um, uh, after a few rolls, you, you, your body's ready for it now. Okay. Yeah. And, and how do you find trading the rolls has been for you? Because uh, I believe it's become much more competitive over time it's changed quite quite a fair bit i mean there is definitely you know um now roles used to move a lot the book right the actual roles um contract whereas now you know it's you're kind of stuck at probably maybe you know two prices which is fine which means you just need to adjust your strategy right so for me that just meant i needed to, to you know adjust from um, holding onto a lot of rolls and letting it collapse in my favor to legging in and out as much as I can, you know, and not taking any directional view on the book. I just want to make sure we don't, uh, we try not to lose as many people as possible here. So when you're talking about <laughs> yeah. legging in and out, mm. um, can you dumb that down a little bit? Sure. Um, all right. Well, I'll, I'll explain what we do during the rolls, right? So during the rolls, the back contract comes alive for the bonds, right? Which usually isn't there, right? So instead of having, for example, just a three-year and a 10-year uh, contract, now we have two three-years and two 10-years, which means we can we can now hedge the front against the back three years, right? And because they're the exact same contract, well, sorry, the exact same product with different expiries, they move mostly in tandem. Um, the rolls book is the price differentiation between those two contracts. Um, so for example, the rolls book might be um, you know, halves at halves at one, right? So halves bid, one offered. Now, June rolls, that book will be massive. You know, so typically in three year, you know, you're looking at, you know, a couple thousand contracts aside. But in the June roll book, this can be a couple hundred thousand aside in the book. So you've got a lot to lean on, so to speak. Um, so if there's one offered, then you will try to leg that spread. Right, by buying the back three years, selling the front three years, hopefully at the price differentiation of one. 
you, know, you might screw up and get halves instead. But either way, you're not short rolls. Um, so you try to leg as many ones as you can. Now, typically, you might wait for halves to trade out, you know, before um, when they use the collapse. Now you might not have the luxury. You have to leg halves back out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That is a more dumb down version, but I'm not sure that's it. Yeah. yeah. That's, no, I think that's good. That's yeah. good. Um, and, you know, this is this is very kind of common stuff in prop trading, isn't mm. it? Um, yeah. And I, I think it's good that people hear this because for a lot of retail traders who don't know anyone in the prop world or what have you, um, you know, it's this sort of trading they're probably oblivious to. And it's it's like most of the prop firms down or in, in Australia, all the prop firms are pretty much in Sydney. Mm. Most of them are doing this type of trading, right? A bar a couple. Fair amount, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make here is it's a very prominent style of trading in Australia. Yep. And, and also, you know, there's huge firms in Chicago who are doing the same thing in, uh, you know, the US futures and, yeah. Um, you said before trading... Yeah, during the rolls period, you're obviously very busy trading sometimes 22 hours a day. Uh, even in your day-to-day trading of the bills, mm. that market trades, uh, it stops um, once in the afternoon and then once in the morning for about, is it an hour yeah. each yeah. time? Yeah. So, it trades that also trades, what, 22 hours a day? Yeah. So, how, does, how do you manage that? Um, well, a few things, right? One, you know, minimizing your exposure to a large event of any kind um so stay stay hedged we don't use i don't usually hold much outrights overnight and of, and two is you know being with a prop firm we have the benefit of having a desk um, a broker desk which services mostly the firm itself and you can leave various instructions orders or even core levels with them right so someone will ring you up you know if if three years break through a new price or or something change in a spread or something like that so that's a 24-hour desk which is the benefit now obviously it means you you will gonna you're gonna get some calls at some weird times and it's it's a that's a lifestyle you know that's that's the thing with trading you know um there's no such thing as a part-time trader i mean unless you're well you know into the veteran stage and and you just want to you know relax and not trade as much but mm-hmm. if you're starting out there's no such thing it's it's a 24-hour market you need to be ready at all times my phone's ready if i'm out at dinner I'm, i might need to run to the office or home you know i have, I have a home set up as well so you know wherever i am I, i'm i'm gonna need to be aware of where things are okay so most of your trading is obviously done during the the day that's session. correct that's where that's where all the liquidity is mostly for the bills yep. during the day um also because you know i do need to stay sane so i you know so majority of my focus trading is during that say 10 hours you know between 8 and 6 p.m and then if something big happens then i'll have another look during the us or europe session okay on that note is there Mm. anything you do outside of market hours which you find helps you during market hours um i mean market hours when you're talking about the bills market and the the bonds it's a (laughs) 22 hours but let's say you get where i'm going with this Oh, you mean like things you do outside to, to just help? Oh, I, I I think people need to learn to also switch off. Like if you're in a full-time commitment trading, switching off is really important. You know, doing something active, man, like something. So I, I do a bit of Muay Thai um, okay. and it's great for releasing some, you know, pent-up anger, um, steam. Um, I, I think, sorry, it's as good as it's going to get, right? Other things, people might, you might need, people might go to gym, go for a run. For me, you know, kicking the crap out of a heavy bag just helps out, you know, gets the blood flowing, gets your mind off, especially if you've had a really bad run. You got you got to go, you know, take a walk or something to change your mentality because keeping, it's all in here. Man. Like I would say 70% of trading, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, man. Um, uh, what have I got here? I'm just, as we're sort of touching on psychology, I'm just... Yep. I've got a, I can, I've got a thing I wanted to say there. Okay. You, yeah, yeah. You go. Because um, earlier I was talking about psychology in terms of you know believing in, um, sort of the uncertainty, right? That anything can happen. You kind of got to believe that now, because if you do believe it, then you're not going to be stubborn when it happens. You're like, okay, fine. That was a, it was a ninety-five five percent trade. 
the five percent happened fuck it it happened right and then you can you're at peace with it now i would say the next step is you know you should reward yourself in a way that's consistent in in how how you sort of want to how where you want your psychology to be right for example you don't want to be just jumping for joy when you make money and going to a deep depression in the corner when you lose money right because if you're rewarding yourself based on the money amount of money you've made it's actually better to reward yourself based on the quality of the trade um because that will make your actions and your psychology consistent with where you're trying to be right you don't want to be the guy who just celebrates making money you you want to celebrate making good trade if that means losing less money you need to celebrate it you know whereas if you make money on a shit trade that's that's where that's where it's really dangerous. So how do you how do you differentiate between the two? Because that can be that can be quite difficult. Um, I've got a good one. Um, it, it's been so long that I don't think the firm will care anymore. But I never told anyone this earlier, right? So, for example, we we trade tier one Australian domestic data, right? We try to jump right on that first second. So when I first started, and I'm talking about five months in, all right? There was one time where. We were all waiting for the unemployment figure, the largest figure in Australia, right? Now, you don't want to go into that with an outright. It's crazy. It's And back then, it would gap 10 points each way. And that's huge, seeing that most trades you're trying to make one or two. Um, I apparently, I I jumped in, right, well, when I thought the data was out. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, the, the market gapped three prices down, right? And I was like, oh, it's out. It's, we're going so down. So, you were already in. Oh, no, I wasn't in yet, right? So I'm waiting for the figure to come out. Okay. And then the market, this is all within like seconds, yeah. obviously, right? The market moved, gapped three prices down. I go, yep, it's out. So I went and sold. And then it paused for what seemed like an eternity. It was only probably another second because it was a bit weird. I was like, why is it paused? And then it collapsed like there's no tomorrow, right? Um, it collapsed so much I didn't even know what price I got in. I had to go check because my DOM was refreshing so fast I couldn't even see the price. Now, I was lucky because I was right. So I made 10 ticks in an instant trade, right? Like it was probably a second. What actually happened is I uh, I, bet I placed a uh, 10 grand 50-50 bet. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a shit trade that I made money on. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So so, so, so obviously there are, there's very clear ones. And I thought I should have, sorry, because it's funny. I mean, they'll hear about it now in the firm. But <laughs> if that went the other way, I might not be here talking to you anymore. Yeah. To, to be really honest. You yeah. Know? And that's the thing as a trader, like I, I, I did a, a podcast just yesterday. It'll come out again. It'll come out, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Yep. Um, probably by the time this time, this, this episode airs. But like in some instances, all it can take is just you to be off guard by just a little bit um and yeah you can be find yourself in a very different situation yeah it's, it's actually all about risk management it's because it, you know it's not everyone's like yeah that's how to make some money it's more about not dying yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah man that's crazy you, yeah you're very lucky that went in your favor oh, absolutely uh, to this day i recognize that okay there's two things in my career could have ended my career i'm just so it takes a little luck to get to not get completely crushed but that being said, I've also had a lot of bad luck. I just don't remember those because these are the better stories. You know? Yeah, like, but that's it as well. Yeah. Like you do also have a lot of bad luck as a trader or it seems like you have a lot of bad luck that when mm. you do have some good luck, it's worth um, enjoying it. Yeah, no, <laughs> why not? You know, I, I couldn't tell anyone that story because I figured they might uh, look unfavorably, but now I'm pretty sure it's fine now. Well, let's hope so because uh, a lot of people are soon to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, what about in examples where it's it's not so obvious, just on like mm. sort of day to day trading? Like, yep. um, I, I would say that the probably rule number one, and I'm obviously I'm assumed the people who's going to take advice from this are relatively new to trading, right? Is following not following your plan, right? Because in the beginning, I would I would hope that is gospel. You know, if you have a plan, you know where are you entering or what needs to happen for you to enter a trade, and then you know, where are you taking profit? Where are you taking the puke? Um, and, and why? And what, for whatever anything needs to happen, right? All of these should should have been planned out before you enter a trade. Now, if you enter the trade and you don't follow that plan, that's a shit trade. It doesn't matter how much money you've just made, right? Um, 
Now, the reason I say that is because in the beginning, it's more often than not that mid-trade decisions are usually not good ones, right? Whether you're under the pump, right? And you know, a typical example would be you you'd you get into what would seem like a short-term trade, and it's starting to come close to your stop. You know, yeah, but on a bigger time frame, this looks all right. So this now is turned into a long-term trade. Now, no one turn, changes a short-term trade into a long-term trade when they're winning, right? They, they will get to your take profit. You're like, great, happy days. I made money. Trade work out. You only do that when it's completely going against you. So that's a really good example. Like you don't, re, in the beginning, you don't really want to be changing your plan. Now, if your plan is crap and that's fine, you know, then you still need to follow that through. Because discipline is really important as well. Having that discipline to follow your plan. Then when a trade's over, you're not in the heat of the moment anymore. You can objectively assess your plan. Maybe it was flawed, but that's fine. This is why you're here. You're learning. You know, it's not about making money in the beginning anyway. Yeah. And as we're kind of on the, the topic of psychology mm. here, I did want to ask you, how do you deal with uh, periods where you're perhaps underperforming and not doing as well as you'd expect to be doing? Um, from a PNL point of view, or from a from a yeah, I, I guess we could yeah. sort of talk about both. But yeah, mostly from a a PNL point of view, like let's say you're just on a bad run, and yeah, I mean I don't know um you know what your bad runs in the past have looked like, but let's just say you know there's been two months go by and you've mm. you know you're not really up. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, that's yeah. Um, I think I, I think um. And I read this in in one of these books. I can't remember what it was. It it says success is perishable, mastery is not. It might have been like a book called The Trading Athlete or something. Um, I, f- I find it really important, right? Because you you know we we value ourselves, and this could even go to day to day life, right? On something, you pride yourself in something, right? Um, you know whether it's your job, your money, whatever, your looks, <laughs> could be anything, right? How well you dance now. <laughs> <laughs> now if you if you you know if you value yourself based on something that's perishable because you think it's not but you know it can like any physical thing is perishable whether it's yeah it's a if it, it's your house it's your money it's, it's to, to be honest you know, your girlfriend or something right then when that perishes you're gonna you're gonna be in a deep state of distress or, or whatever it is right so i guess i've always looked at myself and pr- pr- prided I don't know, sorry proud how do you say it? yeah yeah what's the right word there i don't know right i'll try to say pride myself in it yeah I, yeah it sounds pride weird myself. is it i think that's yeah. the right way so let's pride myself <laughs> well, yeah let's go with it pride myself in my abilities right and both the ability to climb out of holes like you know pnr holes as well as that well, okay, I've had two, you know, some bad runs. If I if I look at it and go, was it really, am I really doing the wrong thing? And that's why I asked you to clarify, you know, that question. Now, if I'm doing the right things by my edge and I've assessed that there's nothing wrong with my trades, it's just that I've taken on, you know, two months of 80-20 trades and they've given me two months of 20% outcomes, then that actually doesn't really affect me as much. You know, I, I, I get really annoyed myself when I, you know, do the wrong things, the wrong trades. So, so therefore, I'm like, okay, I've lost some money or whatnot, but I'm still the same trader. You know, therefore, I can still hold sort of my head up high and go into it again and just go, that was the 20%. Whereas if I, you know, if I was pride myself in my account, then maybe not so much after that too. So I think that's, that's how I deal with it from a psychology point of view. I just, I really focus on, sort of what I can control, which is my skill and how I trade, not the market. Mm. Yeah, okay, okay. Now, Jack, I'd like to go into probably the last subject, which we'll get into, um, talking about Minter Capital. Yep. Because I think this is really cool and this is quite interesting. Um, what are you doing there? What's the idea behind it? Um, so, Minter Capital is sort of what, I've taken from, I guess, my last five, six years of prop experience and going, I think this is what's going to improve the success rate in the industry. And I want to, you know, give people sort of a much better development sort of experience right now. Um, I think it's no, it's no surprise that even in the prop industry, I think the success rates, I don't know what that is, but one in 10, one in 20, something like that. Right. Um, 
and you know i have my thoughts on it especially given i've just finished sort of this is quite fresh for me you know i'm only five years in i'm very junior in this industry um compared to all the, the all the senior guys so i've just gone through the program i've been through a program myself and there are, there are some thoughts that i had there and for me a couple of things was the um one is i'm um, you know i have a very small group you know, I, it's there's only four guys that i'm hiring at each intake at most right and because i want to do that because i want to give them actual sort of more a more close mentoring guidance rather than sort of having people you know having big group people and seeing how how, how they turn out sort yeah. of thing um and the second i guess thing was i wanted to be able to give them mentoring and so just currently myself and another person who is mentoring them um and the di- biggest difference is we're both active and profitable traders um and i don't think that's actually very common um in the industry like you might get mentored from specific men you know people who are hired to mentor you i'm not saying they they might have been profitable traders before but the fact we're still right now full-time trading i think that adds another level of insights to what we can teach the new guys um as in you know the way i came up was i I pretty much never had any help to be really honest um you know there's a few good guys who gave me a few tips here and there obviously mark helped me out but you know in the grand scheme of things it was very self-driven and i think i wanted to give them that um and the last last thing is you know really really putting together a tight team environment um you know trading prop trading is such a lonely job you know it's your own book your own losses, your own gains. Like you can make a million dollars, and you might not have anyone to celebrate that with. You know, <laughs> there's yeah. no team. No one else cares, right? Um, but if you have, but to put together a team and just really have them bounce ideas off each other, have the "What am I doing with my life?" conversations, which you always, you, if you haven't had that, you, you haven't gone deep enough into prop trading, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and and but it's, but I think that's what's going to really help people develop. So I'm really sort of. So I'm changing, I guess, the model a little bit and going, I'm going to invest a lot into fewer people and try to bring them up to be successful traders. Okay. So what's kind of motivated you to do this? Because obviously you could just continue yeah. trading your own book and, you know, happy days. Yeah. Uh, but you've decided to branch out and do something a little bit bigger than just yourself. Um, I, think, I think for two reasons. Um, one, I, you know, I was lucky that I had people that i can really connect with in my trading career and they really add a lot of value to to my trading you know um i mean you know kai so you know Mm -hmm. we used to trade very closely together um when he was still at genesis and then obviously mark helped out a lot as well so i wanted to create i guess another environment like that as well um i think both for myself it sounds a bit selfish but you know what one one of these guys is going to be my trading buddy um, and and you know bounce ideas off each other and stuff like that. Um, so that's probably one of the main motivations. Um, and I do find that you know I enjoy actually contributing. Like this, it's it sounds a little cheesy, but this can be life changing for somebody, right? They they they've done some nine five job. They hate it. You know, if I can help make one person a senior trader, or you know consistently highly profitable trader their life's going to change forever you know and and i'd I'd really enjoy that as well yeah yeah i mean it can be very rewarding to Mm. see other people you've invested time in or helped out yeah and then you know they take the things that you've helped them out with and they really make something of themselves based on that like yeah i I totally get that because i can tell you it's, it's definitely not about sort of um you know what what this business can bring it's really a a rewarding way as well for me because you know when i'm constantly teaching i remind myself to not do stupid crap yeah it's like yeah. i've just said to him don't do that and i go and click it i'll be like that was really stupid you know <laughs> um but yeah it is so rewarding in that respect um yeah now this might be a bit of a, a personal question feel free yeah. we can skip over this if you like but yeah. um I, i'm curious to know because it probably says a bit about you how is this kind of structured? Like, because obviously you're with Genesis. I yep, know you've got yep. some sort of partnership with Genesis. So, yep. what's how does that kind of work there? Well, I mean, in in short, so Genesis, you know, is pretty much backing me to do this. You know, if you really want to think about it, is I'm just simply responsible for training these guys. We are 
in Genesis offers. You know, we're trading Genesis platforms. They're on Genesis Capital. Let's be really honest. You know, that's that's sort of how how this entire thing works. Yeah. And, and are you responsible for their risk? Like, if one of these guys blows up, yeah, or you know loses too much money, yeah, do you have to wear that? Yeah, I do. So, so I'm responsible for their. So when I say Genesis Capital, I mean the margins and all that, right? They so on. But yes, yeah, so, so I'm I'm entirely directly responsible for sort of their risk, which which makes sense because you know I'm developing them, so it goes both ways. Right? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. No, I think that says a lot mm. about you, man, because like that's that's real skin in the game there. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, that's 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 true. Yeah, there's uh that's uh as as they bleed out or as they become successful, I'll definitely be uh I'm very much in them on that. Yeah, because you've got four uh there's four guys, four right? Four guys, that's yeah, right. Yeah, and they're all do they have any trading prior trading experience or they're no. fairly new to or, it? Oh, I mean, you know, rudimentary, like just like myself with my CFD yeah. accounts at best. Yeah. So how did you pick these four guys? It was actually um, it was actually a very long recruitment process. There was a lot of interest. Um, I think I got like four hundred applicants. Did you really? Yeah, I put it, I put on on put up on seek for a month, and it was pretty crazy. Man, um, and but I really wanted to find I had a type of person. You know, to me, like education, like when I say education, I mean like official education, right? Like whatever your degree was, uh, and whether you've done trading before, that come secondary to your the personality right because to, to be a successful trader you've just got to have grit you know you got to go through the dark days you know like every successful trader would have been in a massive hole at least twice in their career you know so t- whereas the other ones just die off in that hole right so <laughs> so if you don't have the grit you, you're not going to be around for long you know so t- that grit and competitiveness you know and not not just Every, everyone says they're competitive but not not just like the kind of you know verbal competitiveness like real competitiveness i.e if you know we play something together and i win you're going to spend the next two weeks practicing that to come back at me you're not going to just trash talk you're literally going to spend your entire time focusing on improving yourself and coming back at it you know trading's like that because you're going to do well do you get crushed you're gonna you could just, just you know mop about or you spend you know, a whole week thinking about how you can improve. So, so, so those specific characteristics. Um, I interviewed like fifty-two people personally, okay. um, and and really, you know, want to look at their character more so than um, sort of other attributes. So, how did you judge that? Like, what what type of questions did you ask during the interview? Re- really, I guess really life life decision based. Um, sort of not sorry, not life decision, life experience based. So I had one guy who told me about, you know, sort of all like, so pretty much asked him, you know, in you, what what's one of the hardest things you've in your life, and how do you bounce back from it? You know, these kind of questions, um, because I'm looking for people who's actually done something competitive as well, you know, whether it's in sports or even gaming. Like, I'm not not casual gaming. I mean, like properly professional gaming, um, sports, poker, something where you're putting something on the line, pride, money. And you can lose, you know. That 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 takes a certain kind of person. Um, so that experience was really people who had that. I obviously looked, you know, favorably upon. Okay, and, and what's the process been like from bringing these guys on? Mm. Uh, how long ago did they start? Because um, so this is all quite yeah, new. This is very new. Yeah. So they went live in November. Um, I started training them midway through September. So what happens is, um, I had. Um, it was scheduled to be seven. They ended up only being five, right? Because people changed their minds who were going through what I call the training program. So the training program is a full-time program for six weeks where they do demo training as well as, you know, I have classroom elements uh, to teach them all the strategies and and actually all the mentality and psychology that trading involves. And But I'm also assessing them during that period. And then, you know, once they finished it, if they passed then they get offered a contract to, to start trading, okay. which started at the beginning of November. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so what are your, how have you, how have you structured the training program? Because mm-hmm. obviously, you know, you've been through a yep. program in the past, uh, which was your foot in the door at a prop firm. Yeah. Um, so, how are you structuring your program, you know, with that experience and with five mm-hmm. years uh, trading behind you now yeah. um is there any 
is there anything you've done differently compared to how you were trained or um yeah yeah so i guess the first thing is i for me i think live going straight into the deep end is is very important like you just got to start trading whether you're making or losing money you got to get involved you don't learn trading by reading books you know you got to you learn trading by through trading so, so they start on demo pretty much day one right whereas i think i would have i started maybe two three weeks in um so there's so we're teaching theory alongside um uh you know demo trading whilst you know they're getting taught sort of i guess real feedback from active trading traders like myself and the other person who's teaching um the second thing is i you know i've I've made this bit more structured to help people ease into this kind of lifestyle because the trading lifestyle is different right Uh, after you become profitable no one really cares like you can become a millionaire or you can stay where you are you got to drive yourself it's your own business right so you know we've we've got a this sounds a bit cheesy we've got a belt system at minter capital right like you become a you start like a, in a martial art way, right? You start at a white belt. Eventually, when you make seven digits, you, you're now a black belt. Um, and, and, you know, so this this goals and setting goals for people, people to achieve. And that's what I found was one of the things that lacked for me. After you've reached a certain point, and for us at Allium, that was like probably 40 lots, trading 40 lot bills, which means you have access to everything else, right? You can trade the curve now because the th- curve minimum is... 33 three years by 10 10 years right you can't really trade if you don't trade that size so once you've gotten to that point kind of that was it you know um so i wanted to give people a real sense of progression as well um so they've got active goals to work towards and they and something to celebrate yeah okay yeah that's cool that's cool so did you say you had five people initially and then it uh dropped to four yeah Okay, so what happened to the fifth person, do I ask? <laughs> I, I could talk about it. I, <laughs> I mean, there's no hard feelings in, 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 in trading. You know, it's, it's one of the least bureaucratic right. industries, right? It's, it's very definitive. It's, it's on a statement, you know. Um, no, it was just the sort of the risk tolerance. Oh, sorry, the risk management for me wasn't really there for the person. Um, but, you know, but the, and that's... Unfortunately, I only have six weeks to look at something. Right, and this is where I make a decision whether I'm going to risk, you know, 25 grand on a, on a single person. So, um, at the very least, I wanted to see, you know, good risk management during, during that period. Um, and that's something, unfortunately, you know, didn't work out for that particular individual. Okay. And will these people, uh, uh, these, these four people who you've got starting with you now, mm. um, are they trading the same products as you? That's, that's right. So, the idea is that they are going to trade using my strategy. Well, it's not mine, but, you know, the way I trade. Yeah. Um, simply because it's, it's proven, you know. Um, they, they have free reign once they become profitable traders to do how they want to do. But if they can get this down, make it their bread and butter. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've got like, you know, a couple hundred grand coming in from one trading strategy and you want to go do something a bit crazy, mate, be my guest, right? Like, but at least this is happening. You don't want to do the crazy thing day one. Right, so they're gonna they're trained in the exact same way as I trade, um, and you know, and it's just this this has like the biggest sort of success rate for beginners. This type of trading. Do you um, do you have any expectations on how long it will take them to reach a certain level of consistency or profitability? Um, typically, it takes I'd say at least six to twelve months to become consistent. Um, but it can be longer, uh, and and that's that's the crazy thing with trading. It doesn't really. There's no set path. You know, there's some people that make money day one, and then there are some people and, um, you know, who who I know this individual who, you know, who took a while, maybe eighteen months, and then has just skyrocketed. You know, so so there's no real. It's not a linear career path. You know, yeah. by any means. But I'd say typically you're going to expect probably six to 12 months okay. at the very least. So what's your longer term vision for the for Minter Capital? Like where do you think this will be in, you know, the next five, 10 years? Uh, if, I'm sure you've thought that far yeah. ahead. Um, to, to be honest, you know, I to me, it's more like one trader at a time, you know, because so I'm, I'm not going to take in traders every quarter because that's too much and I can't focus enough on the existing guys. So at best once a year, I would say. And then from there, you know, I'm just going to keep generating this, these traders. Now, you know, if they want to take on traders themselves, they can. Um, 
sounds a bit like a pyramid scheme, but <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that did that, how that image came up. But no, but you know, all so it'll be like a very organic growth kind of thing. You know, it, for me, it's really about just taking on one trade at a time. It's not going to be like some empire. That's not where I want to take this. It's more about me helping out people okay. and then you know being able to take on a few traders and create a good environment for people who really want to be traders. Okay, solid man. Very cool. Um, I think awesome. I'm just looking over my notes here. I think yeah. I've pretty much covered everything I wanted to chat with you about, uh, plus more. Um, yeah. I don't know. I know you've got a couple notes over there. Is there anything with... No, it's, uh, it's pretty similar to what you had. Um, oh, I mean, I think one final thing would be, you know, for, for traders who's, who's in this right now and they're doing it tough, right? Because that first year is is it's like borderline depressing okay you know you're you're trying to learn right and but because progression is not linear you know like i think you can imagine if there's a point here right where after this point you start making money right and you start here it doesn't matter if you're here you're still making nothing right to to really be patient with themselves for traders you know like don't don't set yourself too much like obviously people have life you know circumstances financial circumstances but you know, don't set yourself sort of limitations and time to hit some something. You don't want the pressure of that. It doesn't help. Um, you have to be patient with your development. You know, it's, it's not a get, it's not a get rich quick scheme, you know, so to speak. So um, that, that'll be my advice for people who, who's in that middle period. You know, I, I was lucky out of a few people I can depend on. And I'll tell you, you know, I've had more than one, what am I doing in my life kind of sh- conversations. It's, it's, but, you know, then you pull through next, next week and keep coming in. You know, eventually it comes in comes back to you but at that point it wasn't that apparent (laughs) i have to say (laughs) yeah of course of course man so if uh, anyone wants to find out more about what you're doing or uh, connect with you online is there a way they can do that are you on twitter Um, linkedin um i'm on linkedin but and it's probably a bit hard to search for me on google that's the problem you know you type (laughs) in jack ma i'm on page 67 right Right. like because of the alibaba guy um i said to my mate um uh, do you know Jack Ma? He's another uh, trader in Sydney here. I said, oh, do you know Jack Ma? I'm going to be doing a podcast with him. And um, he goes, oh, Alibaba guy. And I said, no, no. Yeah, he's like, Aaron, you've done well for yourself, yeah, mate. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know he was a trader, but yeah, that's a good sure, interview, mate. Yeah. Like, that's pretty hard to get. Um, you, can find, um, you, you can find me on LinkedIn um, or you know, on my, onto the Minter Capital website if you're interested in it. It's just mintercapital.com.au. Um, or, you know, can drop me an email if people want to discuss about trading. That's okay. fine as well. And your email address, is that uh, on the website or you want to give it out? Yeah, yeah. I can give it out. Jack.ma at mintercapital.com.au. Okay. And Minter, just to be clear, is spelled M-I-N-T-E-R. Yeah. Mintercapital.com.au. Okay. Um, well, I'll put these links in the show notes, like on the Chat with cool. Traders website. So no it'll all be there anyway. Um, yeah, I appreciate you doing this, man. No, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah.